goods flowed similarly to developing commercial centres, so that there was a concentration of trade in the most conveniently located ports and inland markets. London, Bristol and Liverpool, for example, became wholesale centres with large warehousing facilities and a growing mercantile community. Consumers were better served, both in the regularity of services and in the responsiveness of producers to their changing tastes and demands. England was becoming a nation of shopkeepers. The merchants were a growing proportion of a growing population. Between 1650 and 1750, for example, their numbers increased three to six times more quickly than did total population. Fairs and local markets declined and distribution based on permanent wholesale and retail houses became common. Nothing was more characteristic of the 18th century than the growing complexity of the market and the multiplication of middlemen. In the cotton industry, where foreign trade was important, the merchant played a key role from the beginning. The cotton industry expanded rapidly after 1780, the prototype of factory production. From 1780 to 1800, the main demand for cottons came from the working and middle classes, with female demand dominating. The large domestic servant class, farm and factory labourers, as well as the growing middle classes, now purchased pure cottons when once they purchased linens, woolens and mixed fabrics. And after 1800, all social classes wore cotton, although the bulk demand for cheap cottons remained along with an increasing demand for better cottons like muslins. There was at the same time an increasing export trade which soon ended the centuries-old dominance of the English export trade by woolens. This rapid growth depended on a complex marketing system in which the large cotton merchant played a vital role. In London, the so-called linen houses were stocking large quantities of Lancashire cottons for domestic and foreign sale by the 1780s. Such wholesalers had the important functions of anticipating demand, whether from fluctuations in trade or in taste, and of providing credit for both manufacturers and retailers. They had to be, in consequence, men of considerable capital taking considerable risks. And although less praised in the annals of the Industrial Revolution than the manufacturers, their role was a significant one. During the Industrial Revolution, Britain earned the reputation of being a nation of shopkeepers and of having become the workshop of the world. The two were intimately related. Britain needed a nation of shopkeepers in order to sell the products of its workshop of the world. Commerce thrived only when there had been a significant relaxing in the 17th and 18th centuries of the rules and regulations of a mercantilist state. Economic freedom was not all that mattered. It was the establishment of a society in which there was greater personal freedom in wide areas of human activity that provided the environment in which business enterprise could flourish. In the long run, this increasing freedom resulted in the growth of political democracy and a free market economy. On the political level, it was the struggle between king and parliament in the 17th century in which Parliament triumph that ensured the representative, pluralist and decentralised character of English government as against the autocratic and centralising ambitions of Charles I and James II. On the economic level, it was the decline of mercantilism that led to the emergence of the market as the dominant force directing the economy. The historians have pictured quite correctly this struggle to establish political rights as a reaction against political autocracy. And the moves in the 17th and 18th centuries against the mercantilist economy have been seen also quite correctly as reactions against the economic autocracy of government. 
both political and economic agitation for increased individual freedom took the form of arguing for the removal of the government's restraints on individual action. Greater personal liberty was demanded in all aspects of life, in religious and social endeavour as well as in political and economic enterprise. In 1600, the restraints on the individual in England, political, social, economic, intellectual and religious were formidable. But over the next two centuries, these restrictions were gradually lifted so that by 1800, a wide range of rights had been secured by an increasing proportion of an increasing population. For example, the establishment of political rights in the 17th century made the attainment of economic rights easier in the 18th century. And this gaining of economic rights in the 18th century, in turn, made the further extension of political rights easier in the 19th century. If England was earlier than other European countries in establishing individual rights, it was partly as a result of the nature of her legal institutions and laws. As Lord Mansfield, Chief Justice of the King's Bench between 1756 and 1786 argued. The law of merchants and the law of the land is the same. The approach of judges to mercantile cases was practical. To solve problems and settle grievances and claims as they came up in business life. English law, because of this common sense approach, was in process of continuous revision not as the result of the decisions of kings or governments, but in response to changing economic and social circumstances as reflected in the courts. This flexibility meant that English common law was able to cope with the legal problems caused by economic growth before and during the Industrial Revolution. These political and legal developments, which favored individualism, were reinforced by the influential writings of social theorists, in particular, the economist Adam Smith and the political philosopher John Locke. Locke emphasized the rights of private property and the need for its legal protection and the necessity of upholding the rule of law. Adam Smith attacked the state-regulated economy of mercantilism and provided the inspiration and arguments for laissez-faire. Because England had a relatively liberal environment before other countries, she was the first country able to industrialize. By the 18th century, the rights of the individual had been extended sufficiently to permit an extraordinary release of creative energy. The individual Englishman was free to innovate, free to create, and free to develop business enterprises without hindrance from government, and with the protection of the law. As the barriers to individual enterprise were lowered, social and economic mobility became easier, and businessmen were able, towards the end of the 18th century, to launch the Industrial Revolution. The social consequences of this historic transformation is the subject of the third and final film in our series. <laughs>